The following sermon is a recording from Adventure Community Church in Fresno, California. All right, good, 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 good evening, Adventure Church. It's so good to be with you. I want you to high five three people and tell them it's good to see them. Go ahead. Tell them it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Yeah. If you don't know the person, you just high five. Go ahead and get some information. Hey, this is who I am. Yeah, it's good to be here. So good to see everybody. Uh, If you wouldn't mind, go ahead and open your Bibles. I'm going to make this real easy or pull out your smartphone. You're going to open your Bible or pull out your smartphone, and you're going to go to Revelation 19. Uh, Revelation is the easiest book in the Bible to find outside of Genesis. Why is Revelation so easy to find? Because it's the last book in the Bible. So you cannot go wrong. And then you're going to open up to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. Now that one might be a little bit harder, but let me give you a secret. Isaiah is pretty much in the middle of your Bible. Okay, so if you go Psalms, Proverbs, I believe it's Jeremiah, Isaiah, something like that. Uh, I just, or Ecclesiastes, yes. And then Song of Solomon, then Isaiah, and then, I, and then Jeremiah. But you want to go to Isaiah and Revelation. Isaiah and Revelation. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about the two B words that are used when we talk about the people of God. Now, I know some of you already were like, did he just say that? Yes, I did. Now, when we talk about the church, when we talk about the church, by the way, uh, even though you see it in your English translated Bibles, if you translate the word church correctly uh, from the Greek, it is not church. It is gathering or groups of people. Um, church is actually a German word that, as the Bible was being translated, got thrown in there. So there's your Greek lesson for today, okay? So here's the deal. But when we talk about the people of God, there are two descriptive words. There are two descriptive words that are used. The first one is, you are the bride of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. The second one is, you are the body of of Christ. Did you notice both of those started with the B, correct? The two B words. Go ahead. Go ahead and look at your neighbor and tell them, see, two B words. Go ahead and tell them. Yeah, yeah. How many of you know you need Jesus after tonight, huh? Like, you saw where your minds went. Okay. So it's the body and the bride of Christ. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. We are going to talk about the body of Christ, but we're not going to do it tonight. We're not going to do it tonight because there's a lot there. Matter of fact, uh, when I went to do a little word search on the body and the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ was mentioned very few times, only 16 in the New Testament, and only, uh, I think it was five of them was used in conjunction when talking about the people of God as the bride of Christ. The rest were stories about the bride and the bridegroom and all this other stuff, so it's really interesting. But when talking about the body of Christ, that's a whole other story, and we're going to be able to get into that. For those of you who are very used to Adventure Church, you notice, you notice I didn't give you your one step closer. Well, your one step closer is coming. It's coming at the end of this service. So I know I didn't start off with it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's in here. It's going to be at the end, okay? But I do want you to take one step closer. All right. So when we talk about the body and we talk about the bride. Now, there's a reason why I'm headed in this direction. And, and this might sound familiar. You, you may have said this before, or you may have heard somebody say this before. Uh, I ran into a person, and they told me, they said, I don't like the church, but I love God. Have you ever heard anybody say that before? You ever heard anybody? Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I've, 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 to be honest with you, I've never said that. I've said something like this. I love God, and I'm mad at some people in the church. Come on. Does that make sense? Huh, you ever been there before? I love God, though, but I'm mad at some people in the church. They're getting on my nerves. Of course, you never said that. I mean, I'm just saying this is what I said before. But I, I, I recently have met a lot of people who say, you know what? I love God, but I want nothing to do with the church. And, and, and listen to me. Listen very carefully. I love you. I do. And I want what God has for you. But what you just said is impossible. Listen to me. What you said, I love God, but I don't like the church. That's impossible. Because what I'm going to show you in Scripture 
is this right here, not the building, not the building, not the walls, not the equipment, not the building, you, you are the bride of Christ. I am the bride of Christ. Together we make up the body. Jesus is the groom. When it talks about the body, Jesus is the head. So you can't say, oh, I love God, I love Jesus, but I hate the rest of his body. Now you can't say, I've been hurt by some of the people in the body. You know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, now I'm right-handed. I'm right-handed, right? That's about probably 90% of us. It's an interesting thing that I swing a hammer in my right hand, but I manage to smack my thumb on my left hand. One part of my body used to hurt the other part of my body. Come on, somebody. But I don't say, in my left hand, don't get up and say, man, I just hate the right hand right now. You suck. You couldn't swing anything to save your life. You know, away with you. Let me cut you off. Then it would no longer be a part of the body. I want to begin to unpack this because I believe, now listen, listen, because this is going to be very challenging. I believe that type of thinking I love God or I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Now listen, I believe that type of thinking is anti-Christ. Now I'm not talking about revelation and anti-Christ. Anti means what? Against, not for. Obstinate, right? Uh, uh, coming against. And what is that coming against? The church. It's coming against the head of Christ, the body of Christ. And so what I want to do is I want to unpack to you why, why, this, why this is so important? Because we are called to be the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ isn't just made up of one person. It, John said, I, John, on the island of Patmos, I saw from every, every tribe and every tongue of nation, people gather. It's bigger than me and you. It's bigger than me and you. It's a group of people. It's not just about me and you. And so listen to this. In the book of Isaiah... This is actually, uh, according to my research, this is the second time we see, uh, metaphorically speaking, that we are the bride of Christ, right? This is, this is the second time. However, the first time, it was just a mere, like, blip. But check this out. In Isaiah uh, 62, chapter, excuse me, uh, chapter 62, verse 1. And I'm going to read all the way down so you get context. Verse 1. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. This is the Lord speaking. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. So her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow upon you. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Do you get the picture here? Isn't this encouraging? He is saying, I'm going to, you're going to be it. I mean, we're going to roll out the red carpet. I got plans for you. Check this out. No longer will they call you deserted or, your name, or your, na your name be called deserted or your land desolate. But you will be called, somebody want to say that word? Did you see that word? I had to look that word up like seven different ways and seven different times. But the word is actually hepspaba. That's the word. And that land simply, that, that word simply means this, I delight in her. I delight in her. Now check this out. And, and this is what he says. And your land will be called Beulah, which means married. You will now be married unto the Lord. Check this out. As a young man marries a young woman, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Rejoice over you. Head on over to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation chapter 19. Here we go again. So from Isaiah to Revelation uh, 19. Verse 6, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of a rushing waters and like uh, loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and as his bride has made herself ready, fine linen, bright and clean, was given for her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
uh, for your word. We thank you for what you're about to share with us and, and shine the light on for us. Father God, I pray I speak not as a man, but as an oracle of you in Jesus' name. Amen. So he talks about us being a part of the bride. Talks about us being part of the bride. And the first note that I want you to take is that's a covenant of marriage. We are married to Christ. We are in covenant relationship with Christ. That's an exclusive relationship. And all throughout the Bible, if you begin to read, you're going to see that that's all Christ ever wanted. That's all God ever wanted was for you to be his people and him to be your God. But we, as the people of God, kept selling ourselves off. We kept selling ourselves to the highest bidder, to the lowest bidder. And so what happens is we began to cheat on the Lord. And so in the, in the New Testament, he comes along and he says, listen, I'm going to pay a price for you. I'm going to enter into this covenant of marriage with you. And I want you to know that this is all in for me. I want you to do something. Um, uh, go to the book of Ephesians, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, you know, get out on your smartphone or uh, pick up a Bible. Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, it's pretty much uh, right there in two-thirds of the way into the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 5. But this is what I want uh, you to do. Uh, while you're getting there, I want you, and some of you can write this down, uh, I want you to write down the expectations, the expectations of your bride or the expectations of your spouse. I want you to write those down. What do you expect your spouse to do? And it may start off with, well, I expect my, my husband to be a hardworking man and, and bring home the bacon. And then, you know, wives, you might say, well, I expect my husbands to not only bring home the bacon, but also do dishes and vacuum. Come on, somebody. And so husbands may say, I expect my wife to pack my lunch in the morning before I go to work. I expect a hot meal when I come home and it's got to be on the table. I expect my clothes ironed, okay? I, amen. <laughs> so whatever it is, I want you to go ahead and start, start posting, you know, post a little something in your head or write it into your phone or go ahead and make you a little list. Go ahead, make a little list of what you're expecting. Believe it or not, while you're writing that list, the truth is we all have a list. I know when I got married, and, and I'm not, you know, my wife and I, we're going to celebrate 20 years tomorrow of marriage. Yeah, 20 years. Woo! That's what happens when you get married in junior high. That's what I'm talking about. So uh, it's funny is, uh, <laughs> was it in Arkansas? I don't know. So what's funny is when I got married, I didn't know my wife thought I should be a plumber. And, like, I should know how to fix a sink and a toilet and, you know, all that. But she convinced me that I could do it. And this is before y'all had YouTube, okay? So, you know, you had to go get you a book and had to read up on it. But my wife used to say this all the time. If something would happen in the house, she goes, baby, you can fix it, can't you? And I didn't know I signed up, and here it is, to be a carpenter, to be a plumber, to be an electrician, to be in a mechanic, right? I'm not no mechanic, man. I mean, this, this, is, how, this is not working. And so we all have these expectations, and it's funny is no matter what you say, no matter what you think, you have an expectation. I had an expectation that my, my wife would cook like my mom. And she's laughing right now. <laughs> she thinks that <laughs> she knows. I had that expectation like you don't know how to cook. You don't know how to cook. You don't know how to make beans. You can't make some Spanish rice. I mean, this is it. What am I doing? And, and, and we had this expectation as well as like, hold on, you don't clean like my mom cleans. And, and you got to understand, my mom likes lines in the carpet. Come on, somebody. You know what I mean? And my mom used to come in after I made my bed, and she'll remake my bed. Hello. Uh, could you tell? That, you, you see where this is going? How many of this has been a long 20 years? Come on. <laughs> but we all got expectations. So think about your list, or look at the list that you wrote down. Look at that list. To you, to you, that's not a reach. That's not a far stretch to you. To the person you're going to marry or the person you're married to, that might be a reach. But can I ask you this question? Look at your list and what you're expecting. Could Christ expect the same thing from you? Could he expect the same thing from you? You know, some of you in here, whether you admitted it or not, whether you would admit this or not, you don't like when other people are late. But you're okay if you're late. Yesterday, I was going to the post office, and um, there was, I was two cars behind being able to drop the mail into the mail slot. And this elderly lady was really struggling to get her mail in. 
And, and I could tell. So she puts her car in park. And I'm like, man, I'm not in that much of a rush. You know, I felt bad. And, like, you know it's a bad day when you got to open up your car door and you got to get out and put it in the drive through slot. You know, you're just not doing well. And there's an elderly gentleman behind me getting livid. And I can see him in my little side mirror. And he starts honking at me. And he starts giving me, well, I can't show you the hand gestures, but y'all figure it out. He wasn't landing planes, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he told me to go fly one, though. <laughs> and so, <laughs> that was funny. And so, he's honking. And then finally, he pokes his head out, and he could tell us the lady in front. And now he is laying into his horn. I mean, just laying into it. And I felt bad because the elderly lady, she was really struggling to get back into her car now. I mean, bless her heart, you know. I mean, it was really a struggle. And, and, and I thought it was interesting, and I said to myself, here's a guy completely impatient for a woman in front of him, but I noticed him trying to get out and make a right back into the lane. And, or excuse me, you're only supposed to make a right, but he was going to make a left, okay? And so he was holding up everybody else, and everybody else was getting upset. And he was upset that they were getting upset with him, like, hey, can't y'all wait for me? And it's funny is, listen to me. We're so quick to want to receive grace, but we're so slow in dispensing it. We're so quick to have our own list of do's and don'ts, but yet we hold, ourselves, we, we hold others to a standard we don't even hold ourselves to. Go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, we're okay. Tell them we're okay. We're okay. We, we, I just started meddling right now, but we're okay. We're okay. You're, you're going to be all right. So we have this list. We have this list. And, and this is what I want to do for you. Holding your finger in Ephesians 5, right? Holding your fingers in Ephesians 5. Can I share this with you? A covenant of marriage, um, I believe, uh, has at least these three pillars. At least. And I want you to write these down. They're not going to be up on the PowerPoint because I want you to write this down. And I'm going to say them over and over again. You're going to get it. There's at least three pillars in, in, in at least three. And I'm going to give you the three that we have defined our marriage off of, and, and here it is. If we're going to be the bride of Christ, then we have to know these three pillars. Love, that was simple, right? That was simple love. I mean, that's like elementary. But there's also acceptance and forgiveness. Love, acceptance, forgiveness. And, and when I was doing my study, I, I just got a visual of an equal sign, right? So love, acceptance, forgiveness equals, right, Grace. This all equals grace. You know, a lot of times when I, when I do premarital counseling and I get ready for the big day of the wedding, you know, everybody always talks about, you know, you got to choose the right partner, you got to choose the right partner, you got to choose the right partner. But the truth is, you need to grow into being the right partner. Because what you need at 20 is not what you need at 40. Come on, somebody. Come on. We got married at 20. And what she needed at 20, she would not put up with the 20-year-old Anthony right now. And, and, and she shouldn't have to. Why are you shaking your head? I see you. At the corner of my eye, I see you shaking your head. All right. <laughs> but it's the truth. And, and trust me, the 20-year-old Anthony is not going to be able to take care of her like the 60-year-old Anthony can when we're both 60. Do you see, do you see where I'm going with this? And so, and so I, I really, I've got to stress this. Um, that we entered into this uh, covenant together called marriage, and, and we are the bride of Christ. And, and, and so Paul in Ephesians 5, and we're going to get to this in just a second. Paul in Ephesians 5, he stresses about marriage. And right in the middle of, of going on uh, what would almost just be like a soapbox experience, he says, and I'm talking about Christ and the church. In other words, he's saying, I'm talking about Christ and the people of God. And I want to show that to you. Go to Ephesians uh, chapter 5, go to Ephesians chapter 5, and just why not, let's start off at verse 21. It says, submit one another, excuse me, submit to one another out of the reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your, yourselves to your own husbands as you do unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body for which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to who? As the church submits to Christ. Now, see, the problem here is when we say church, y'all just look at me and you look at the building. But the truth is, if I was reading this correctly, this is what it would say. And you, and in that you is me, so as us, 
we should submit to Christ. You, me, us. The sum total of the whole us. And so right there, he's making a strong correlation like, are you submitting to Christ? And I love how he says, husbands, as you would expect your wife to submit to you, are you that submitted to Jesus the Christ? Are you? Because this ain't going to work. If you're to lead by example and you're not submitted to Christ, how do you even know what to look for in your wife being submitted to you? Once again, holding people to a standard that we're not, you, you, you see where this is going? Now check this out. Now, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And he, why did he give himself? To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. Through the word. The only way to get your mind right is to wash it with the word of God, period. Nothing else will work. You have to wash it with the word of God. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed it and take care of it. Uh, they feed it and take care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Think about this. Where was Jesus before he was born in a manger? He was in heaven. Who did he leave that he might come marry his bride. He left his father. And for this reason, Christ left heaven and he became the only begotten of the father. He left his throne, his kingship. He left everything that he might come and be in covenant relationship with you. We are the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Here's the million dollar question for tonight. Here it is. What type of bride are you? What type of bride are you? He has given us, he has given us love, acceptance, and forgiveness. He has given us grace. He has given us everything we need. Now, now, now here's the deal. With love, acceptance, and forgiveness, and, and that equals grace, the problem is a lot of us, myself included, we don't understand the word grace. Matter of fact, after next week, after we talk uh, about the body of Christ, we're going to dive into a very touchy subject called grace. And this has the potential to really wreck a lot of us. Because there's two types of people in the extremes of grace. You got one end of the spectrum where people want grace for everything. And they're like, don't worry, I can go ahead and sin because I know God will forgive me. And then I'll come back and I'll tell you then they don't know grace. That's not how grace operates. Then you got the other end of the spectrum and, and, and these are the people who, you know, like, you got to work for grace. Like, no, 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 I got to do my penance, and I got to make sure I really tell God I'm sorry, and I'm never worthy, and you know what? Then you don't know grace. Grace is so much more than the church has ever been able to articulate. Matter of fact, I put this in my, in my notes. Grace isn't something I can't really teach, although I'm going to try. Grace isn't something that I, can't, I can preach although I'm going to try. But grace is, however, something that I can model. I hope you caught that. Grace is something that I can model. Why? Because I've experienced it. I can teach grace only to a certain level. I can preach grace only to a certain level. But I can demonstrate grace to the fullest because once I've been touched by it, then freely I can give it away. How do we know that? Because the people like the 10 lepers experienced grace, but the one who came back to worship the Lord was truly in an experienced relationship with the saving grace of God and to which Jesus said to him, weren't there nine others? But only you've come back. How about the woman at the well? I am so happy Jesus didn't say to her, look at here, you dirty woman. You stanky woman. 
coming out here at noon to get you some water because you ain't been nothing but a low-life prostitute woman. Get away from me. You're filthy. He never said that. He never said that. He said, because of grace, I can look past all your mistakes and get to the root cause of what keeps you in the sin cycle. What about the woman caught in adultery? He didn't belittle her and call her any name. He didn't go around and say, yeah, that name Ho fits you. He didn't say that. He didn't call her a harlot or a whore. He said, where are your accusers? Then I ain't accusing you either because I need to get to the root and I need to, I need to help you the best way that I can help you, and that is to heal what hurts you. And because of that, because of those responses, these people, what did they turn around and do? They went around and they shared the message of grace. Don't you think it was interesting for the woman at the well to go back into her city and start preaching? You don't think she picked out a few people? Hey, we were just together last night. You need to come here about Jesus because I ain't going to be with you ever again. You don't think he was picking people out? Oh, don't worry about a girlfriend. I know he, you, know, you thought he was with you last night, but you know, two nights ago he was with me. But yeah, you need to know about Jesus too. You don't, you don't think she did that? The Bible says if you go on to read in John 4, the whole town came to know Jesus. The whole city because of one woman's testimony. Because she experienced grace. Go back and look at the message. Jesus didn't bring up grace once. Because it must be demonstrated. And he demonstrates that to us his bride. Because who more would need grace? You need so much grace in a covenant relationship of marriage. You need so much grace. Jesus is perfect. It's us that are, the, <laughs> that are making mistakes. We need the grace. And the grace was given to the, th the thief on the cross. The grace was given to Peter as he denied Christ in a critical hour. Grace was given to John who did not show back up at the empty tomb. Grace was given to Thomas when he said, Lord, unless I put my fingers through your wrist and through your ribs, I ain't believing nothing. Grace has been, has been dispensed this whole time for us that we might continue to remain in the covenant of marriage with Christ the King, our bridegroom. This is it. But our experience is this. I don't know that we've really experienced grace. I don't know. There are times, sometimes I feel like I just need to do a little bit better job of repenting for God to know that I'm sorry. And it goes like this, God, I'm sorry. No, like, I'm serious, I'm sorry, sorry. You know what I mean? They're sorry, then they're sorry, sorry. You ever done that? Huh? And then you find yourself saying stuff like this, are you ready? I will never do that again. How many of you did it again? Right. It didn't work. It didn't work. I want to show you, um, my wife's going to give me a hand. We have a mentality um, when it comes to being married to Christ. We have a mentality that is just a very defeated, a defeated mentality. It's a mentality that when we look up there, we wonder how Christ, yeah, no, just right there is good, yeah. We wonder how Christ could love someone like us. How Christ could be married to someone like us. Because the truth is, if you could picture, you can leave it down on the ground. That's fine. Yeah, you could just put it right there. If you could picture um, the day of the wedding, we come with a lot of baggage. We come with baggage. I know for me, I came with lust and shame and Loneliness. I know I came into the marriage very broken. And the truth is, on the day of my wedding, there, there's not even enough baggage here and luggage here to represent what I was coming to the altar with. I was so weighed down. And I think if we were honest, we come as the bride of Christ. And some of us have a very hard time even understanding that we're married to Christ because we come with so much stuff. Why would he want to marry me? I'm filthy. I'm, I, I'm ridiculously filthy of stuff. I'm broken. I feel rejection. I feel abandoned. 
I have fear in my life. I've got anxiety problems. Uh, I, I, I struggle with sin and lying and guilt. I felt abuse and addiction and loss. Uh, I, I feel the pain and the anger. And so we got Christ who is up here ready to receive his, his bride. As, as you said, come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We got Christ who's up here. And, and just as every uh, uh, bridegroom, just as every uh, man who's expecting to see his bride walk down the aisle, he's up there with the pastor and he's like all excited. Like, I can't wait to see my bride. And, and, and we are the bride. We are you and I. And we come in and we're walking slow to the altar because we're carrying all this luggage. And this is how we approach God. We approach God and we're like, and, and, and Lord, I really want to believe I'm in covenant with you, but, but I just can't get past the fact that I'm dealing with so much shame now. And I don't know that you love me. Because why would you love me? Nobody loves me. You don't understand, I'm embarrassed about some things. I'm embarrassed. But the bridegroom, Christ, our beloved, our husband, says, you don't understand, I'm built to carry this. And so he says, I actually have a place that it can hang. And he says, don't worry about your sin and your guilt and your lying because I can hold that too. And he says, don't worry about being uh, rejected because I've come to accept you and, and I've come to love on you and I've come to just accept you just as you are. And I don't care about anything you're struggling with because if you stay with me long enough, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to take care of you. And so up at this altar... He goes ahead and he straps himself to a cross that carries it all so that you don't have to. So that you don't have to. In church, this is what it means to be married to Christ. You're not alone. He covers you. And this is going back to Ephesians. And just when you feel like the devil's really laying into you and you feel all alone, Christ says, I will wash those thoughts with the reading of the word, with the word of God over your life. And so he speaks to this and he goes, you're never alone because I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's gone and it's washed away. And you're like, but no, no, no. I said I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And it's washed away. And then you see all these things and he goes, sin? No, 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 no. I've overcome sin. And he washes away. And he washes us clean as we're in covenant relationship with him. But here's the question. In this relationship as the bride of Christ, and here it is, we must remain faithful. You and me. And I want to share this with you. We must remain faithful. And, and here's the only way to remain faithful. This shouldn't shock you. Is you have to remain in love with Jesus. It's not works-based. It's not if you did seven devotionals this week, then Liz, then you're in love with Jesus. It's not, oh my gosh, Tyler, you sang seven hymns this week. That's perfection right there, bro. That's it. You've arrived. It's not works-based. It's not works-based. You know, uh, you always see this in a good romantic movie. There's a moment in, the, in that movie where, where, the, where the young lady looks at the man, and he doesn't really say anything, and she just goes, I can tell you love me. It's in your eyes. <laughs> right? Is that, am I right? Am I right? And your wives still do that to you. You're not loving me right now because it's not in your eyes. Your eyes don't say love. They say harsh things, mean things. It's not love. Right? But it's in the eyes. It's not in the works. I know a lot of men who are convinced just because they bring home a nice paycheck, their wife is happy. You're wrong. 
I thought I got like seven amens on that one, but you know. <laughs> but it's the truth. But it's the truth. It is the absolute truth. So here's my question. It's not a workspace. It's a simple, it's a simple thing like this. Are you in love with Christ? Are you in love with Christ? And here's the deal. I cannot maintain that for you. I can't. I mean, there's days I get up here and I wish I could preach like T.D. Jakes. And, and I figure, man, that would really help you to maintain your love with Jesus. Or if I could, you know, if I could preach like Dr. Uh, David Jeremiah or Chuck Swindoll or somebody who's really big on the radio. And, you know, and, 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 and if I could do all that, then you guys would really love Jesus. No, no, no. I can only be Anthony Flores in Fresno. That's it. Adventure Church. Yes, thank you. And here's the, here's the truth. And I can't make you love him any more or any less. So listen to me. Listen to me. So the next time somebody says, oh, I love God, but I hate the church. No, because you are the church. Paul just said you can't hate yourself. You're it. You're the body of, you're the body of Christ. So what you're saying is you're hurt and you really hate yourself. Then let me, let me introduce you to grace. Let me introduce you to grace. Because the same, listen, the same body that managed to hurt you is going to be the same body that manages to heal you. You don't think we've all been hurt in church? Oh, yeah, we all got stories and scars. But you don't think I've been helped in church? We all got hope and healing. So here's what I want to say to you. Are you in love with Christ? You know, I, I, found, I thought this was interesting in the uh, book of Jeremiah, chapter 2. Now, I, I'm pretty sure I, Jeremiah is right after Isaiah, if you're still in Isaiah. And if it's not, forgive me if there's like some little book in between, but it's right there. Jeremiah, chapter 2. I, I want to read this to you. Um, I don't know about you, but God speaks to me in several different ways. And if the worship team wants to come on up, because he actually spoke to me through a song. Um, I was thinking about, are you in love with God? And, and I'm an 80s baby all the way. And um, uh, just so you know, and the only thing I kept hearing in my head was, you lost that love and feeling. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm sorry, I know, I, I don't know if that's bad or not, but... I just, I just kept hearing that in my head, you know, you lost that love and feeling, and then I immediately went to Top Gun and blah, blah, blah. All right. So anyway, so, <laughs> so check this out. So I, I'm, I'm just, I'm chuckling to myself because, you know, the Lord speaks to me in these, in these strange ways. And I know it's him because I know the progression of thought where I'm going with this. And so I put, are you in love with him? Um, some of us, we've lost that loving feeling. And here's, and here's why. And, and listen, because we fell in love with someone or something else. That's how that happens. A man who's cheated on his wife never wakes up the next day with that woman right next to him and goes, whoa, how did you get here? That doesn't happen like that. Something had been dying a long time ago. And so we must sustain that. Well, how do you sustain that relationship with the Lord? Well, it's the same way you sustain a relationship with the person you love. And that's the quality and quantity of time you spend with them. That's, that's also... By, by lavishing gifts on one another. So your money. And there's one more. And here it is. It's your thoughts. Your thoughts. You always know a young couple who's madly in love because all they ever talk about is the other person when they're not together. Come on. And you all look at them like, can y'all just shut up? Jeez. Come on. But in all actuality, it's kind of cute. It's like, all right, that's good. Jeremiah chapter 2. I want to read this to you. The word of the Lord came to me and he said, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. Who's talking? God. 
I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride, you loved me. You loved me. You followed me through the wilderness, through the land, not shown to you. Israel was holy unto the Lord, the first fruits of the harvest. All who devoured were held guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. And, and realistically, this is what I'm going to say to you. I'm going to break it down to you. He says this, I remember when we were so in love, you would go anywhere for me. I would say, hey, go give that guy $5. And you would just say, is that all, Lord? You just want me to give him 5 I'll give him 10 right now. Yeah, just 5 Hey, I want you to come away with me and spend an hour in prayer with me. I want to show you and tell you some things. You were so in love with me, I would say, hey, I just want you to quit your job because I got something else for you. And you just said, yes, Lord, I'll quit. I'll just I'll follow you anywhere. What he's saying is you would see my miracle hand in every aspect of your life and you never questioned where I was leading you because you were so in love with me. Like a bride who was chasing her husband around. Just saying, I can't get enough of you. I just want to be in love with you. Matter of fact, what I'm here to declare to you, he says, is, is even when people would try to step up and try to steal my bride, I stepped in and said, you take one more step, Jack, and I'm going to knock you out. That's what he's saying. Because he said, you follow me out of the land of Egypt. He goes, I would roll up my sleeves and I would get to work. Ain't nobody taking my bride. She's mine. We were so in love. Hear the word of the Lord now, Jacob. You descendants of Israel, my bride. This is what the Lord says. What fault did you find in me? Where did I go wrong? That you left me for somebody else. That you followed worthless idols and you became like them, worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us out of Egypt, who stood up to Pharaoh, who led you through a barren wilderness, who left you through barren deserts and creeks, and a land that was in utter darkness. He says, do you not remember that I brought you to a land of flowing with milk and honey? What did I do that you left me? Where did I go wrong? Whew. I don't know. I don't know. I just know it to be true. I just know it to be true. I walk away. It's not him. It's me. When I saw that in Jeremiah 2, I just put, that's me. He's done nothing but bless me. He's done nothing but led me to a land flowing with milk and honey. And listen, he's given me no reason to ever walk away. I chose to. But today, church, because of grace, I choose to walk back. And he's still there waiting, saying, I don't care who you've sold yourself to. I'll buy you back. I'll buy you back. And I don't care if they're asking for twice as much. I'll pay it. I'll buy you back. Because you're my beloved. You're my beloved. I want to be bought back. I want to get rid of those things because he just bids me to come and he welcomes me, but it's me. I tell him I'm not good enough. And he says, no, there's love, acceptance, and forgiveness. He bids us to come because he's a good, good father. Close your eyes with me.
He bids you to come. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Here at Adventure Community Church, we believe in one step closer. Whether it be one step closer in your relationship with Christ, or one step closer in slaying that Goliath that stands in our way, we believe in the power and person of the Holy Spirit to take us one step closer. That through an intimate prayer life and an understanding of God's Word, there is no limit to what God can use us for.